Good morning. I'll be reading this morning scripture from the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. That's Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Then was Jesus led up to the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward unhungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I ask that he read that text to you this morning because it serves as a good introduction to what we're going to talk about with regard to the fruit that God has called us to bear. Fruit, in the Christian, in the spiritual sense, is an attitude of heart and mind. Don't stop listening right there, okay? It's not just an attitude of heart and mind. It is an attitude of heart and mind that is expressed in a behavior that shows our relationship with God. Our heart and mind must be expressed as a behavior. And this fruit is a requirement if we're going to have any credibility at all in being followers of Jesus. It's one thing to say, I'm a Christian. It's another thing to say, I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus. It's another entirely to be a follower of Jesus, and that is what God has called us to be. And the only way we can do it is by bearing fruit. Now, we've, we've talked about fruit a lot this year. Bearing fruit is our theme for the year. We've talked about fruit being this um, willingness to share with people in need. Fruit as being a, a dedication to fairness in a world that is, that is not fair. But we, are, we try to be fair. It is a contentedness with what God has given us rather than always seeking more and being dissatisfied with what we have. But it's not just those things. It's the response that comes from love and joy, and peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness, and self-control. Fruit is also the mercy that flows from having received mercy from God. And this morning, I want to talk to you about another fruit. It's mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus expresses it this way. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. This fruit is one holy hunger. I want you to notice that fruit bearing is not optional. Jesus says, if you abide in me, you will bear fruit. If you don't abide in me, you won't. But the idea is that you are to bear fruit in your life. And that bearing of fruit cannot be accidental. It is not accidental. It is not happenstance. It is not incidental. Bearing fruit for the Lord is not like finding wild berries in a field. Okay? Those things may just grow out there, but that's not the way spiritual fruit is. Spiritual fruit grows because we are intentional about it, because we act on our intention, and because we work at it. And there cannot be fruit if we're not working at bearing fruit. And you see this in the text verse that Anthony read. Jesus was deliberate about hunger, right? He goes into the wilderness for 40 days. What do you think? He, he just forgot to pack a lunch? Or do you think he knew by being in this wilderness for 40 days, I'm going to get hungry? So why didn't Jesus take food? Because he's intentional about it. He intends that he will be hungry. Well, what's the point of that? Maybe the point of it is that every time Jesus felt hunger, like you and I would feel hunger, like a ham sandwich, you know, salad from Chick-fil-A, something like that, Every time Jesus felt hunger, he was reminded that his real hunger 
ought not to be for food that will last only for a little while, but ought to be for that which lasts forever, which is the righteousness of God. It is that constant, constant reminder of it. And so, when Satan comes along, and Satan says, You hungry? Turn no stone into bread. What's wrong with that? Nothing wrong with that. And nothing in the Bible says that if you got the power to turn stone into bread, you can't use it to feed yourself. Nothing at all. So why doesn't Jesus do it? Because for 40 days He has reminded Himself there is something more important than hunger that is fulfilled by something that is temporary and insufficient. You know how that works, right? I got up this morning. I had breakfast in my house. I had a couple of slices of that cinnamon raisin toast. It tasted good. A lot of sugar in that. About the time I got to the church building, my breakfast was gone. And I was dragging. I didn't eat anything else, okay? But the point is, if I'd have had me an egg, I'd have been better off. A little protein. That would have lasted. All right. It is the righteousness of God that lasts. And what the world offers us is sugar. It's something that is temporary. It is insufficient. But we must be intentional that we will hunger and thirst not for that which doesn't last, but for that which is eternal, which is the righteousness of God. We're supposed to hunger and thirst for that. So, all right, let's talk about what in the world is this righteousness? And the first thing, before we answer that, the first thing to note is that righteousness is, doesn't come to human beings naturally. And i got to do a little aside here, so I'll step aside. I don't want you to think that I'm saying that people are born into this world sinners. Okay, I'm not saying that at all. We are born into this world innocent babes. We become sinners. Do you know why we become sinners? Well, because we're tempted, absolutely. Why else? Because it's easier to sin. That's the easy road, you see. That's the shortcut. And that's fundamentally the temptation that Satan offers Jesus in Matthew 4 and in Luke 4. The temptation to take the easy way. Satan will say, fall down and worship me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Isn't that what Jesus came to do? To be? He wanted to be king, right? God's plan was that he was to be king, that he would initiate his kingdom, right? And so Satan says, I'll make it happen. I will make your dream come true. And he could have. That's why it was a temptation. But it never would have been God's kingdom. You with me? It would have been Satan's kingdom. But it's a kingdom, right? Why can't you just settle for that? And that's what Satan calls us to, is to settle and to take that easy road. We're not naturally trying to take the hard road, are you? No. We want the easy road. The psalm, and that's why the psalmist says, there is no one righteous before God. It's why Job says, a mortal cannot be righteous before God. Now please do not misunderstand. That's not to say that no one can ever be righteous. Because what does the Bible say? Noah was a righteous man, right? And Zechariah and Elizabeth in the New Testament, they're righteous people. So it's possible for folks to be righteous, but the point is, that righteousness does not come innately. Righteousness has to be worked at. It has to be strived for. It has to be an intentional gain. But if righteousness is not a natural human trait, it is a natural divine trait. God is righteous. Daniel says, the Lord is righteous in everything He does. God is totally righteous. And to be righteous, finally we get to what is righteousness, to be righteous is to do what is right. 
and understand that doing what is right is not doing what you think is right or what I think is right. Doing what is right is doing what God says is right. It is adopting and following His standard of righteousness. So whatever else can be said about this subject, about what, what is righteousness, righteousness is living like God would live. And so Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst to live as God would have you to live. They will be filled. How will that be seen? If I live the righteous life, what will it look like? I could give you a number of illustrations, but I'm just going to settle on a few for this morning. First of all, there is a dedication to truthfulness. I'm going to tell the truth. There is this little story that's often overlooked in the Old Testament about Jacob and Laban. Laban is not a truth teller. Laban is dishonest. We'll get to that in a minute. But for now, Laban's not a truth teller. Laban will tell Jacob, you work for me and I'll give you these wages, but Laban's going to change his mind, all right? He's not a truth teller. And Jacob puts up with it about all he can, and finally he says, I got to have, I, I got to have something to live on. So here's what I'd like to have. Give me all of the inferior goats and sheep. Those are the speckled, the spotted, the streak. Okay, the, give me the inferior ones. And this will be my righteousness. You go back and look at it later today. He says that. This will be my righteousness. That when you inspect my flocks, they're all speckled, spotted, streaked. They are the inferior kind. You will know that I am truthful because I have an inferior flock. All right? Righteousness means we tell the truth. Righteousness means that we are honest in all of our dealings. We don't take advantage of people. When I was a boy on the streets, you could buy produce, and uh, often the, the sellers would have hand scale. It was a stick really. Nice straight stick. Had a string on both ends. One end of it, it had a tray. The other end of it had a hook. And whatever you were buying, they'd stick on the hook. And in the tray, they had these weights that they'd take out of a bag. And the book of Genesis says, you will not have differing measures in your bag, right? So if it says this weighs a pound, it really weighs a pound. You want to be sure of that. Christian people do not take advantage of others by dishonest means. You go buy a gallon of gasoline, how do you know you got a gallon? Maybe you got nine-tenths of a gallon, right? You say, well, nine-tenths, that's almost a gallon. Yeah. If you're the store owner and you're getting nine-tenths of a gallon for every gallon that you sell, or you're selling nine-tenths for every gallon you're supposed to be selling, you're making a tenth of a gallon on every sale. That's dishonest. And that's why there's those little stickers on that gas pump that says this pump has been inspected and this pump has been calibrated and you can be sure that you got your gallon, right? Christian people are honest in everything that they do, but they are not just truthful and they are not just honest. They stand up for those people who are, who are mistreated by others, who are marginalized. Job says, I will never deny my righteousness. Job believed himself to be righteous. And I think as far as God was concerned, Job was. What does God say to, to Satan? Have you seen my servant Job? Nobody like him in all the earth. And Job himself, though he is greatly oppressed, Job says, I am righteous. His friends say, no, you're not. Job, if you were really righteous, these bad things wouldn't happen to you. And Job says, I will not deny my righteousness. And here's what it looked like. I rescued the poor when he cried for help. And the fatherless who had none to assist him. God's people are interested in those people who cannot help themselves. The poor, the fatherless, the widows. Next week we begin about three weeks of talking about Orphan Sunday, leading up to the third week's Orphan Sunday. 
It's an annual event here where we take up a collection to support organizations that specifically take care of orphans. That's righteousness. But it's not just that. Job goes on to say, I was eyes to the blind. I was feet to the lame. I was father to the needy. And I took up the case of the stranger. I think that's interesting. I took up the case of the stranger. What, what is the temptation when people are going through tough times or being oppressed, and we don't have any clue who those people are, you know, they don't, they don't live near me. We say, well, I don't know those people. They're strangers. But Job says, I took up the case of the stranger. And then Job says, I broke the fangs of the wicked, and I snatched the victims from their teeth. The world ought to be credibly afraid of Christian people. Why? Not that we're going to do you bodily harm. Okay, This text doesn't say go punch somebody out, they do something wrong. But because we are steadfastly opposed to those people who will mistreat others. And we're not going to tolerate it. And we're going to do it within the bounds of legality and propriety. We're going to see to it that those who do it are changed or removed. Job says, I just broke their teeth. All right? That's righteousness. And this kind of righteousness, understand, cannot be built up. Uh, you can't live your life living righteously, and then decide, well, I, I'm, I'm going to do this bad thing over here. But I've done all this good stuff, and so it's bound to outweigh the bad stuff I'm getting ready to do. Righteousness cannot be accumulated. You're only as righteous as your next act. And so God says the righteousness of the righteous man will not save him when he disobeys. And the righteous man, if he sins, will not be allowed to live because of his former righteousness. One other point. Righteousness cannot be held outside of community. All right? You cannot be truthful alone. You cannot be loyal alone. You cannot be honest alone or benevolent alone or just alone. These traits of righteousness can only be done within community, within association with others. And so it's impossible for a person to hunger and thirst for righteousness while getting off by himself. Right? We hunger and thirst for righteousness within the community of the church. We hunger and thirst for righteousness within the community in which we live. Last thing, I'm done. The only one who is inherently righteous is God. We've already made that point. And a holy hunger and thirst to be like God is that fruit that must be seen in our lives. But you need to know this is a losing proposition. What? It's a losing proposition. God says, this is the way you're going to live. And so you work and you work and you work and you work to be that way, right? You're intentional about it. You act on it. I'm going to work to be righteous. You will not be. Paul says it's not those who hear the law who are righteous, but it's those who do the law. That, that's what I did. That's what I mean. I did the law. It's not what Paul says. Paul says it's those who who do the law, who will be declared righteous. You with me? After I've done all that I can do, I've only done what's been expected, right? Jesus says, I'm altogether an unprofitable servant, right? Okay. But when I hunger and thirst after righteousness, when that's demonstrated by the way that I live my life, God comes in, and God says, He is righteous. 
having desired with a holy hunger to be like God, and having demonstrated that hunger in our lifestyle, we trust God to declare us righteous no matter what our failings. And so, Jesus' words come true. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness are filled. We are filled by God. Let's pray. Father, sometimes we sing that hymn, Oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures, Jesus, thy perfect likeness to wear. If we sing it and don't mean it, we're sorry. We pray your forgiveness. It is easy to sing the hymn, Lord. It's harder, however, as you know, to make that holy hunger come true. The world offers us all kinds of sweet goods that are attractive but temporary and not altogether nourishing. We ask that you help us to say no to them that we might remain hungry and focused on that which is real food, your will. Help us in our effort to remain hungry for your righteousness that we might ultimately be like you. And then, Father, we pray that you will fill that hunger yourself and remake us in your image. Father, help us to make this our constant longing in prayer. We pray again for the nation in which we live. We ask us, we ask that you help us to live your righteousness that we might draw our countrymen under your rule and into your kingdom. And we pray for relief from this pandemic that tries us so. We pray for strength to endure it. We pray that you will make it your refiner's fire that will change us for the better. And Father, until then, we pray that you will keep us in your love and in your care, that you keep us safe and well. In Christ's name, amen. Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Thank you for gathering today. I hope that our worship to God has been acceptable in His sight. And we will be dismissed. Those of you on the far back row, if you will leave first.